Hi guys, Dane here, and welcome to a belated October reading wrap-up. No, this is September. This is even worse. This is how belated this is. I've dropped the ball massively, but we're back. So I'm just going to go right into it. I don't want to take up too much time, because I do also need to film my October haul, and then my November haul, and edit it all. But it's fine. Alright, so we're going to start off with Primo Levy, the survivor. So this is Penguin Mini Modern number 48. I will read you the blurb. From the writer who bore witness to the 20th century's darkest days, these verses of beauty and horror include the poem that inspired the title of his memoir, If This Is A Man. So as you can tell, this is some poetry, and as I usually do with poetry, I'm going to actually read you one of the poems out. I might as well read you, uh, If This Is A Man. If I can find it. What the hell? The Dark Stars. No one should sing again of love or war. The order the cosmos took its name from has been dissolved. The heavenly legions are a snarl of monsters. The universe besieges us, blind, violent and strange. The sky is scattered with horrible dead suns. Dense sediment of shattered atoms. Only despairing heaviness emanates from them. Not energy, not messages, not particles, not light. Light itself falls back, broken by its own weight. And all of us human seed, we live and die for nothing. And the heavens perpetually royal in vain. So as you can tell, it can get quite bleak, and I like that in a collection of poetry. So I gave this one, I think, a 4 out of 5, and uh, yeah, number 48. So as you can see, we're getting towards the end. Alright, next up, I read The Employee Experience Advantage by Jacob Morgan. So this is non-fiction, and uh, I read this for, basically, I had to uh, read and then write like a Spark Notes version of it for a client. So this basically just talks about what a company can do to create an experience, I guess. So it's broken into parts. So for example, uh, we start off with the evolution of employee experience. Then we've got the reason for being in the three employee re experience environments. So that's physical environment, technical environment, the cultural environment, some reasons on why invest in employee experience, and then basically a guide on how to do that. And then we have a bunch of case studies, uh, lots of like tips and tricks you can use, checklists, all that kind of stuff. It was alright, I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. I, I'm getting a bit bored of business books, to be honest, but it is what it is. Alright, then next we have Vladimir Nabokov, Lance. So this is number 49 in the Penguin Mini Moderns. The, the, the uh, blurb says, These three dazzling stories of obsession, mania, and an extraterrestrial nightmare feature all the wit, dexterity, and inventiveness that are the hallmarks of Nabokov's genius. And uh, this is my first exposure to Nabokov. Certainly... Because there, there have been some other Ru uh, Russian authors in the collection, I did enjoy La uh, Nabokov more. Whether it's going to stick with me, I mean, it's, it's already fading from my memory, to be honest. So I'm, I'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5 for that. And then finally we have Wendell Berry, Why I Am Not Going to Buy a Computer. This is Penguin Mini Modern number 50, the last one of the box set. I actually did a video where I wrapped up the box set, so I will link below to that as well. Uh, the blurb here, the great American poet, novelist and farmer argues for a life lived slowly and the value of home. Now, this for me was a 2 out of 5, unfortunately, because I just didn't agree with him. I kind of get where he was coming from, but the essay he was talking about was written in like 1990 or something. So computers then weren't what they are today. And for me, personally, I just find it much more efficient to write on a computer. I can also do research while I'm there. I just think it's a vital tool and he's basically saying writers shouldn't have a computer and it's like, mate, writers have to have a computer these days. Times have changed, you know? So it just didn't, it didn't seem relevant anymore. And also he just came off as kind of this like miserable, surly old man who's upset by the constant progression of technology, you know? All right, then we have Ollie Jacobs, Bad Sandwich. So I read this for Tarden Danes. Indie read along and again, I'll link below to a review I did of this now It's hard to read the blurb on this But it's deliberately hard because the book itself is uh, it's very experimental So it plays with layout formatting that kind of thing. I'll try and read the blurb It says uh, where to even begin born of an alcoholic fever dream bad sandwiches on the surface a simple tale of one man and his quest for Zaz after consuming the titular snack and then it goes insane Wise dogs, banana cowboys, psychotic puppets, and much, much more. You can't so much read, you don't so much read Bad Sandwich as survive it. Good luck and God help you. I'm truly, truly sorry, Ollie Jacobs. So there we go. Uh, I will give that one a four out of five. A lot of other reviewers haven't enjoyed it, but it's kind of one of those books. 
Uh, it's not that you, people don't get it as such. It's that you have to be a certain kind of reader to enjoy reading that kind of experimental, almost psychedelic stuff, you know? And uh, fortunately, I am that kind of reader, so I enjoyed it. But it's, it's definitely not for everyone. It's never going to be uh, a bestseller or anything like that. Here we have Leavis Carroll, Alice in Brexit Land. And so the blurb here, when Alice follows Dave the camera rabbit down the Brexit hole, she emerges into a strange new land where up is down, black is white, experts are fools and fools are experts. She meets the Corbin pillar, smoking his hooker all day and being no help to anyone. Trumpty Dumpty sitting on a wall he wants the Mexicans to pay for. And the hard Brexit pushing queen of heartlessness. Will Alice ever be able to find anyone who speaks sense? So this is a parody of Alice in Wonderland. But it's all Brexit themed. It's similar to the uh, Enid Blight, uh, the Enid Blight and Famous Five for Grown Ups books. And actually, I think it's, uh, I think they're published by different presses actually. But we have some illustrations. Uh, we have here, for example, Chapter Four, The Cheshire Twat. Where, where was that poem? I just saw a poem. Here is an illustration. Look, it's Nigel, it's Nigel Farage as the Cheshire Twat. It was a bit blurry, but whatever. How I long for the olden days, golden and gay, when posties would whistle and bid you good day, when folks were polite, wouldn't dare make a fuss, and no one spoke Polish while riding the bus. The land of the hedgerow, the spinny and fen, of gooseberries and sponge cakes and uncles called Ken, where ruddy-faced fellows drove funny old cars, and birds didn't mind a bloke slapping their arse. We'd never ask questions, we knew all the answers. We liked Morris Miners and loved Morris Dancers, and bullshit like bulldogs, John Bull, Bully Beef, and never acknowledging beauty or grief. The White Cliffs of Dover, the National Trust, Spitfire's even song, B. Winters bus. The hats worn at Ascot, keep calm, carry on. The Bible and blackface and eating a swan. Steeples and cobblestones, banter and cheer. Elgar and Churchill and warm English beer. We'd raise up our flagons and toast to the Queen, then talk about all of the totty we'd seen. And, and people took pride in their strong English names, like Blenkinsop, Robinson, Jenkins and James. That's just how we like them, although by and large, we didn't mind... I don't know how to say this word. We didn't mind Huguenot, 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 names like Farage. I'm smitten with Britain the way it was then, when women were women and men could be men. For life was quite marvellous back in the day, unless you were African, Jewish or gay. So as you can see, it's still kind of relevant to this, to our, our times now, even though it's actually a few years old, which is depressing that it's still relevant. I'll give it a 4 out of 5 just for the lols. Okay, then we have Lucy Crookshanks, The Road to Rangoon. So Lucy is Lucy from Book Axe here on Booktube. And again, I read this one for Tarden Danes, Indie Read Along, and my review for it is linked below. I didn't enjoy this as much as her first one, uh, but I, I did still enjoy it. You know, Lucy's great at this world building, except it is our world. It's kind of historical fiction, so I'll read you the blurb. Here we go. Shortlisted for The Guardian, not the Booker Prize, because we all know I love prizes. Vietnam, 1980s. Propelled by greed, fear, and hope, three desperate lives are about to collide. Alexander, a US Army deserter engaged in the dark business of trading women. Han, a girl trapped in poverty who believes Alexander is the answer to her prayers. Fuck, a businessman who gambled everything to save his family and must now pay his debts. From a society torn apart by war comes a heart heartwarming tale of salvation and redemption. So uh, yeah, I think the reason I didn't enjoy this one as much is because I thought it was going to directly follow on from the first one and it didn't, not really. Uh, I still enjoyed it. And uh, I'll give it a 3.5 out of 5. If you're into historical fiction, you, you should probably give it a go, especially if you like that part of the world. And I know Lucy's done a fair amount of research for it as well, which is why it feels so believable, why the, why the world building feels, you know, so, uh, yeah, so, so believable. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Then we have C.C. Bell, El Defo, which is a graphic novel. So, uh, oh, bloody hell, there's a long old blurb here. Right. Starting at a new school is scary, even more so with a giant hearing aid strapped to your chest. At her old school, everyone in Cece's class was deaf. Here, she is different. She is sure the kids are staring at the phonic ear, the powerful aid that will help her hear a teacher. Too bad it also seems certain to repel potential friends. Then Cece makes a startling discovery. With the phonic ear, she can hear her teacher not just in the classroom, but anywhere her teacher is in the school, in the hallway, in the teacher's lounge, in the bathroom. This is power, maybe even superpower. Cece is on her way to becoming El Defo, listener for all. But the funny thing about being a superhero is that it's just another way of feeling different and lonely. 
This funny, perceptive graphic novel memoir about growing up deaf is also an unforgettable book about growing up and all the super and super embarrassing moments along the way. As you can see, like the 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 uh, illustration style is quite cute. I just didn't like the main character, and I I feel bad for that because obviously you're supposed to feel sympathetic towards her, and I do. I feel sorry for her for you know her her disability, and I can kind of see how that affects her life. But then she was also very frustrating, and at some at times I just think I don't know. She just wasn't very likable. I'm sure it was honest. But I just didn't like the character very much, and so for that it made it suffered a bit for me. So I gave it a three out of five. It was all right, but it, it wasn't as good as I was expecting from all the hype. All right, next up I read this is one of my buddy reads. It's Truman Capote in Cold Blood. So classic true crime nonfiction, arguably, you know, one of the most influential works in the genre. So uh, a natural-born killer with a dreamer's gaze and a tattooed blue-eyed blonde boy. They killed and killed till the whole house was dead. Agent Al Dewey of the Kansas Bureau of Investigation has a crime to solve. A horrific crime. The cool slaughtering of an entire family of God-fearing farming folk. Blood and hair all over the walls and only a few dollars missing. All Agent Dewey has are two footprints, four dead bodies and a whole lot of questions, none with easy answers. Truman Capote's brilliant reconstruction of the events and consequences of that murderous November night in 1959 is a superb and gripping mix of journalistic skill and sheer imaginative power. Okay, so this one I ended up reading, you know, 20 pages a time uh, before I was going to bed. Now, that's not because it was a bad book, far from it. In fact, racing time, I gave it a 4 out of 5, I think. Uh, it's just... It's heavy going, especially for the first hundred pages or so. So the first chap, uh, the first section of it is called "The Last to See Them Alive," and that's really setting up the background of the case. And I don't know, it was just tough going. It, it just took a while to get through that. But then once I got through that part, it really kind of barreled along and picked up steam. And it was just fascinating to read, really. I mean, I love crime documentaries and stuff like that. So if you like crime documentaries and modern classics. Just do yourself a favour and read this. And I think everyone that I read this with a buddy read enjoyed it as well. So I'm glad I, I finally got to it. Okay, then we have another buddy read. So this one is John Green, Paper Towns. So I, again, I'll read the blurb. The thing about Margot Roth Spiegelman is that really all I could ever do was let her talk. And then when she stopped talking, encourage her to go on. Due to the fact that one, I was incontestably in love with her. And two, she was absolutely unprecedented in every way. And three, she never really asked me any questions. Quentin Jacobson has always loved Margot from afar, so when she climbs through his window to summon him on an all-night road trip of revenge, he cannot help but follow. But the next morning, Q turns up at school and Margot doesn't. She's left clues to her disappearance, like a trail of breadcrumbs for Q to follow. And everything leads to one unavoidable question. Who is the real Margot? Now, the real Margot is somebody that I didn't like, but I didn't really like Quentin either. In fact, I didn't really like any of the characters in this but that's not unusual for me with John Green's books and sometimes I do still enjoy them this one not so much I mean it was okay it was competently written uh, nothing wrong with the editing really as far as I can tell and uh, I just didn't enjoy the plot or the characters too much so I gave it a three out of five I I've read most of John Green's stuff now and I think this is probably the one I've enjoyed the least I'm not sure which one I enjoyed the most after that, I reread Dracula by Bram Stoker. So obviously, this is a classic. I read, uh, reread this via audio for Catalyst Reads Rereadathon, and I also posted a review of this as well. So I will link to that below. I will read you the blurb. Take the papers that are with this, the diaries of Harker and the rest, and read them, and then find the great undead and cut off his head and burn his heart, or drive a stake through it, so that the world may rest from him. In 1897, at the age of 50, Bram Stoker was touring manager to the actor Henry Irving and was enjoying a modest success as a journalist and writer. Publication in that year of Dracula was to bring him international fame. The Dracula mythology has inspired a vast subculture, but the story has never been told better than by Stoker. His myth is powerful because it allows evil to remain mysterious. Virtuous action has no more impact than Jonathan Harker's shovel. The high virtue of Lucy can simply be drained away, as her blood is drained away, until she too joins the vampire brood. Van Helsing's high thinking and scientific skill cannot resist the dreadful potency of the undead. Only the old magic, a crucifix, garlic, a wooden stake, can provide effective weapons against the, count against the Count's appalling power. So, 
A lot of people have been reading this recently actually for Halloween and stuff. I first read this probably about 10 years ago now. And I remember it, I was staying at my girlfriend at the time's house and she had quite conservative parents so I had to sleep in like downstairs in the living room area. And it had these like glass doors that opened out into the hallway and then the rest of the house. And I couldn't sleep because I was reading Dracula. And then I could just, uh, I don't like having open doors or anything like that or like I can't sleep with curtains open so it just really really freaked me out so I just spent, I stayed up the whole night and read Dracula basically. I gave it a 4 out of 5 that time, this time I bumped it up to a 5 out of 5, absolutely adored it, I really enjoyed the audiobook as well and uh, yeah it was good. Then we have James Herbert The Rats, so the story behind this is that my mum got me this copy of this at uh, her hospital, they had a book exchange there but also it has some meaning to me because I used to have a hamster and my dad was watching Deadly Eyes, which is the movie adaptation of this, and my hamster escaped and he was watching the movie and he just turned around and the hamster was there just staring at him and it scared the crap out of him. So the blurb for this, it was only when the bones of the first devoured victims were discovered that the true nature and power of these swarming black creatures with their razor sharp teeth and taste for human blood began to realise by a panic stricken city. For millions of years, man and rats had been natural enemies, but now, for the first time, suddenly, shockingly, horribly, the balance of power had shifted. So, James Herbert has been compared to kind of Britain's answer to Stephen King, and this is basically, that's a pretty good explanation of him, based on this book at least. It's the only one of his that I've read, and it is just badass horror, basically. Quite a bit of gore as well. The rats are just messed up, some of the ways that people die and the way that the rats attack them, but also... Basically, if you get bitten by the rats, you're screwed. So you might as well give up anyway. So they're, they're a, a hard enemy to fight, you know? And then I really enjoyed the ending for this one as well. I'm going to give it a uh, four out of five, I think. Graham Greene, The Little Steamroller, little kid's book. When the little steamroller discovers smugglers at London Airport, he knows he can't let them get away. Will the brave little steamroller save the day? This classic tale was one of Graham Greene's first children's books and one of the earliest works by master illustrator Edward R. Dizone, who has inspired generations of artists. So yeah, it's just a cute little kid's book with some nice little illustrations. Yeah, I just enjoyed it. Uh, 3.5 out of 5. I mean, I'm obviously not the target audience, but I am a big Graham Greene fan, so I'm trying to go through all of his books, and that includes his, uh, his, his uh, children's book. All right, J.A. Hazley and J.P. Morris, How It Works, The Wife. So this is one of the uh, Ladybird books for adults, and so... Uh, I don't think there is a blurb for this, actually. So I'm just going to read you part of this so you get a feel for the writing. When a wife feels sad, she eats chocolate. Chocolate makes the wife happy. But eating chocolate makes her worry about her weight and her skin, which makes her feel sad. Still, there's always chocolate. Sometimes the wife needs a break. Gail is happy she managed to find a few hours with her best friends, away from her home, her husband and her children. They are all relaxing by talking about their homes, their husbands and their children. And then it has little illustrations and stuff. So, you know, just a kind of a humorous book, really. A uh, good gift to give to somebody, perhaps, for Christmas. 3.5 out of 5. I, I can't give it any lower or higher than that, really. All right, then we have this, which is by various authors. EUPL, nine prize-winning authors from Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. So I actually picked this up from uh, London Book Fair and uh, finally got around to it. It's in uh, both, you know, the original languages and in English as well. Uh, so... It doesn't actually give all of the English titles here, but... So, for example, it's actually got an excerpt from Breathing Into Marble by Laura Cynthia Cernia Skate. I think that's how you say her name, I'm not too sure. Which I've actually read. I've read the full novel of that. We have uh, an excerpt from Gel Garver 94 by Janice Jonevs from Latvia. Uh, I haven't read that yet, but I really want to. Well, yeah. Three from Estonia, three from Latvia, three from Lithuania. Probably a pretty good introduction to that kind of writing and that kind of the, kind of the cultures of those, uh, you know, those the writing cultures of those uh, countries i'm gonna give it a i'm gonna give it a 3.5 out of 5 i don't know how the presentation could have been improved but i feel like it, it could have been it just it feels a bit cheap but then again it was being given away for free so all right then we have l frank Baum, the wizard of oz i read this as a buddy read with uh, some people i can't read the blurbs for any of these because they don't have them i really enjoyed this though so i'm not one who was really raised on the on the movie i have seen it a few times and i did watch it again after finish reading this but it's not necessarily a part of my childhood and i actually prefer the book to the movie i'm going to give the book a 4.5 out of 5 and I just think some of the bits in it that didn't make it into the movie are excellent. Like they go through a field of poppies and they all start to fall asleep. And I'm there like, that's opium. 
They're like, <laughs> that's heroin basically. And I also thought it's interesting the parallels between this and Harry Potter because basically a wizard tells Dorothy, a young child, that she has to go off and murder a witch. And like Dumbledore tells Harry he has to kill Voldemort. So I just don't know what it is with, you know, children's books where they're turning children into assassins. Anyway, then we had Cressida Cowell, How to Cheat a Dragon's Curse. So the blurb for this, can Hiccup find the antidote to deadly Vorp and Titus and fight the Doomfang? Can he brave the axe of Norbert the Nutjob and be the hero yet again? And uh, I can't remember which book in the series this is actually, I don't know if it says. Uh, no, I don't think it does. But I've been reading these uh, out of order anyway, they're the How to Train Your Dragon books. Very entertaining, this one was no different. I will give it, I'm going to give it a 3.75 out of 5, because why not? As you can tell, I'm trying to whiz through these, not 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 keep keep this going for too long. Okay, here we have Ariana Huffington, F uh, Fanatics and Fools, The Game Plan for Winning Back America. Now, I was actually going to DNF this, and then I realised it's signed. It says, To Andrew, Best Wishes, Ari Ariana. So basically, once I learned it was signed, I didn't want to get rid of it, so I ended up reading it. I did read it as one of my bedtime books, so again, 25 pages at a time. Now, the weird thing here is this was written around the time of, I believe, the 2004 elections in America and the goal was to avoid getting George Bush re-elected. Obviously that didn't go so well. She also talks about when she herself she ran against Arnold Schwarzenegger for governor of California. She lost that as well unfortunately. What's interesting is a lot of the stuff that she says in here kind of predicts Barack Obama in, in terms of the leader that she says that the uh, Democrats need. It basically turns out to be Obama. Overall I gave it a 3.5 out of 5. It's dated now and I don't see why you would read it. But I did read it anyway, just because it was signed, so yeah. Alright, then we have Angry Aztecs by... Where's the... There, here it is. Then we have Angry Aztecs by Terry Deary. So this is... Uh, I started reading a bunch of the horrible history books, because I have a box set of these, so... It says, it's history with the nasty bits left in. Want to know why the Aztecs like to eat scum? Why, when the world is going to end? How to play a really violent ball game? Discover all the foul facts about the Angry Aztecs, all the gore and more. Now what's interesting actually is because these are kind of reprinted now, but obviously the Aztecs said the world was going to end in 2012 and this was written and released before then. I mean, the Horrible Histories books were basically a part of my childhood. I didn't read the Angry Aztecs at the time just because I was never particularly interested in the Aztecs. Still can't say I am to be honest. So for that reason I'm going to give it a 3.5 out of 5. It was fine for what it is and uh, I will talk some more about Horrible Histories soon because there are more coming. So. Then I read Captain Idiot's Guide to School by Ian Walsh, 2 out of 5 unfortunately. So Ian Walsh also wrote uh, The Idiot Book and I think he wrote both of these when he was like 14 and they're just kind of full of cartoons and silly jokes and that kind of stuff. But it's just that the first book was really nostalgic for me so I thought I was going to enjoy this and I read it and it was just... The sense of humour was just too puerile for me, you know, I'm sure it would work fine. I think not even for 14 year olds, for like 10 year olds maybe. But it is what it is. Alright, then we have Poetry in Emotion by Scroobius Pip, so the blurb here sums it up better than I could anyway. In 2008, poet and spoken word hip-hop artist Scroobius Pip set out on a project to publish a collection of his poems drawn by artists he'd recruited from his MySpace page. The brief was simple, each artist had to include every word of the lyrics. With a selection of new artwork inspired by street art, graffiti, tattoos and crime noir movies, this unique visual collection brings a whole new dimension to Scroobius Pip's singular lyrical stylings. So as you can see you get like a wide variety of different art styles. It's a weird mixture between a poetry collection and a graphic novel. It's like illustrated poetry basically. And uh, it will mean a lot more to you as well if you've ever listened to Dan Lassac vs Scroobius Pip. Uh, so for example... He has a song where it goes, The Beatles, just a band, Nirvana, just a band, Minor Threat, just a band, etc. So that's why all of these are the band logos saying just a band, which is quite cool. All in all, uh, four out of five, I think, yeah. Okay, then we have Big Sur by Jack Kerouac. So the blurb for this. In 1960, Jack Kerouac was near breaking point. Driven mad by constant press attention in the wake of the publication of On the Road, he needed to get away to solitude again or die, so he withdrew to a cabin in Big Sur on the Californian coast. The resulting novel, in which his autobiographical hero Jack Deleuze wrestles with doubt, alcohol dependency and his urge towards self-destruction, is one of Kerouac's most personal and searingly honest works. 
Ending with the poem C, Sounds of the Pacific Ocean at Big Sur, it shows a man coming down from his hedonistic youth and trying to come to terms with fame, the world and himself. So this is another one that I read again 20 pages at a time in bed. Again, not because it was a bad book. Four out of five, we'll get into the rating now, why not? Uh, I really enjoyed it, I think the uh, writing in it was beautiful. Bits of it did drag on at times, but that always happens with Kerouac, I think, and I still really enjoy reading this stuff. I actually would probably say I preferred this to On the Road. On the Road, I think, is actually one of his weaker books. Still a good book, but a lot of his other stuff is, like, it's more philosophical and almost more grown... Well, he is. He was more grown up at the time, you know, and it comes through in his writing. And, uh, yeah, I would recommend it if you're a Kerouac fan. Okay, then we have Nick Cave and the Ass Saw the Angel. So, the blurb for this one... Outcast, mute, a lone twin cut from a drunk mother in a shack full of junk. Eucharid Eucro of Eucalor inhabits a nightmarish southern valley of preachers and prophets, incest and ignorance. When the God-fearing folk of the town declare a foundling child to be chosen by the Almighty, Eucrid is disturbed. He sees her very differently, and his conviction and increasing isolation and insanity may have terrible consequences for them both. So this was recommended to me by my friend Amy. In fact, she said it was one of her favorite books and I happened to have a copy of it that was just on my TBR pile. So I picked it up, got to it, and it was, it was excellent. This is another one a bit like Bad Sandwich where you need to have a certain appreciation for kind of wordplay and more experimental writing to really enjoy it. It's also kind of biblical and the setting of it reminded me almost of Stephen King's Dark Tower books. Again, if you're also if you're a Nick Cave fan, definitely check it out. I've heard his other book isn't as good, but um, yeah, this was great. Really enjoyed it. And uh, if you've got like an HMV or whatever here in the UK, which I thought had gone bust, but they are apparently still around. There are two for five pound and they include that book. So there we go. Okay, then we have Terry Deary, Awesome Egyptians, another Horrible Histories books. So this one is if you want to know which king had the worst blackheads, why some kings had to wear false beards and why the peasants were revolting. So I really enjoy the Egyptians as a civilization. I think I probably did actually read this as a kid, but I read it again anyway, because why not? This one will be a four out of five. I didn't really learn too much because I already do know quite a lot about ancient Egypt through documentaries and other books and that kind of stuff. But it would be great if you're a kid uh, or you have a kid and you want to get them or they're, they're interested in uh, Egypt and pharaohs and mummies and that kind of thing. Uh, one thing I would say about the Horrible Histories books is they do have like a lot of quizzes in, which kind of annoy me as a reader because you have to like read it, then decide on your answer. And then you like turn it upside down to see the, ans the answers and it's just a bit of a faff, but hey ho. And finally, we have Balmy British Empire by Terry Deary. And this is for if you want to know how a war started when a Brit insisted on sitting on a stool, who wore a necklace made of 50 human schools, and why a Brit soldier used his own coffin as a wardrobe. So this one has some bad reviews on Amazon because people accuse it of being like a bit lefty, you know, and uh, basically highlighting a lot of the terrible things that the British Empire did without necessarily talking about the good stuff. But it's horrible histories, that's the point. It talks about all the, you know, horrible stuff. So for that, I thought it was pretty accurate. And I, I'm going to give this a four out of five as well. I was probably expecting to give it a little bit less because I'm not particularly interested in, especially the British Empire. I'm kind of ashamed of it a little bit, to be honest. But uh, no, enjoyable enough. And uh, yeah, happy days. Oh my God, I'm losing my voice and I'm tired. I've been in front of the camera for like half an hour filming this thing. But anyway, that is the end of my September wrap up. So now I just need to sort and film my October wrap up, sort and film my November wrap up, edit them and post them. So goodness knows when you're seeing this, but uh, I'm catching up. The police are outside. I didn't do anything. And anyway, on that note, thanks as always for watching. Don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books and if so, what you thought of them. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.